the first home that Megan and I ever had was graduate student housing. And it was in Chicago, and so we rented furniture. Uh, the couch that we rented had no back to it. It had cushions, but it had no back. And we would regularly go, don't lean. Oh, now you're behind the couch. <laughs> Um, we had no end table, so we took our moving boxes, and we went to Target and bought something to throw over the top of them, and we had boxes as end tables. And we looked at each other, and we went, our children are going to hate us someday. Because they will complain, and we'll go, yeah, well, we had boxes for end tables. <laughs> so when, when we first moved to our, our first regular apartment in Fremont, California, one of the first things that we did is we went down to uh, the Navy Exchange and bought a kitchen table and six chairs, which now 28 years later are down to four chairs, three of which are iffy, and I won't tell you which when you come to my house. Uh, <laughs> and the other day, we, were, we, we keep a tablecloth on it all the time. Uh, for very important reasons. And the other day we changed the tablecloth and I looked at the top of the table and I just had this wave of emotion uh, that came over me. And I looked at that thing and I saw that that table has been an art center. There is glitter and there is paint and there are dings from things being hammered on it. And I looked at the chairs and every single chair has marks on it from where Rachel and Allie had a booster seat and it twisted. There's also stickers, remnants of stickers from when our kids decided that the chairs needed decorations. Um, and then I looked at the table itself. I thought, man, how many prayers have been prayed at this table? How many, how many times have we laughed at this table? More than a few tears have been shed at that table. Decisions about life have been made at that table. Taxes have been paid at that table. Crises have been worked through at that table. Hopes and dreams have been nurtured at that table. Failures confessed, problems solved. But the most important thing is that hundreds and hundreds of people have sat at that table for meals. Over the four churches that we have served, hundreds of people have had dinner at that table. We sit there as a family, and we invite our friends, and we eat life, and we eat together, and we do life together. Because there's something sacramental about meals. There's something that's different when you share food together. A, a sacrament is something that has an outward reality, but also an inward reality. When we share the Lord's Supper in a little while, there will be the outward reality of the wafers and the grape juice. But the inward reality is something that God does to us when we join Jesus around his table. There's something that's happening outward when we gather around any table. You know, we're eating. But there's something that happens inwardly because there's a bond that's shared at a table that is different from any other bond, and that's God's work. Today we're going to look at Luke chapter 19, uh, a very familiar passage of scripture for many of you, um, and one I actually touched on on Easter a couple of weeks ago. It's the story of Jesus and Zacchaeus, so we're going to read verses 1 through 9. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but because he was short, he could not see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him, since Jesus was coming that way. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this and began to mutter, he's gone to be the guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to this house because this man too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. The story about Zacchaeus is a life change story. Zacchaeus was wealthy. Zacchaeus had it all. 
but it all fell flat. No matter how much Zacchaeus had that other people envied him for having, it still wasn't enough. He, he had every, every bit of success by any way that you want to measure it, and somehow it still wasn't enough. In the last two days, as I've watched the news a little bit, uh, two different celebrities have committed suicide. People who were successful in different industries, who had money, who had fame, who had all of the friends that money can buy, and it wasn't enough. And they took their own lives. I've also been watching the autopsy report of Prince, you know, and, and however it was that that death happened, it happened out of desperation. It happened because medication was needed to cope with a life that many of us would just envy. Zacchaeus had all of the success of life, and yet it wasn't enough. This is a salvation story. And it's summed up in the last line that I read to you. The Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. Post-Easter, we're in this Bring Them Home series. Because the people that we are around are like Zacchaeus. We live in Gig Harbor. And there's a tremendous level of, of success in this place. There's a tremendous number of people who have done very, very well for themselves in lots of different ways that you would want to measure it. They look like they've got it all together, much like Zacchaeus did. But you don't have to scratch too deep in the surface to discover a bunch of kids who are trying to deal with the horrific home life that their parents have left for them. You see adults who are trying to cope with the pressures of the cost of living. You see people who have no moral compass, who've been taught to take care of all their needs and all of their wants, and they have the assets to do it, and yet it doesn't lead to satisfaction. It leads to emptiness. We know these people. Some of us are these people. And just like in the story of Zacchaeus, Zacchaeus climbs a tree, partly because he's short, partly to hide, I think, and just take a look. But God sees him. Jesus was surrounded by, I don't know how many people, but there were tons of folks. And just like you ignore people that you feel awkward around, it would have been super easy for Jesus to just ignore Zacchaeus. Oh, there's that tax collector. But instead, he finds Zacchaeus. He sees him, even where he's hiding And he engages him in relationship. Maybe the people that we know aren't hiding in sycamore trees. Maybe they're just hiding behind their gates and their bank accounts. But they're hiding nonetheless. And there's this rich picture. You have Zacchaeus who looks like he's got it all together and yet has deep, deep needs. And you see Jesus seeking him out because Jesus can make a difference in his life. And that's an important thing to know about God. God is always seeking us out, not to suck the fun out of our lives, which is what many people are concerned about. Too often it's Christians who suck the fun out of people's lives. But what Jesus is looking to bring people is hope and healing and possibility. Jesus is seeking Zacchaeus. Jesus is seeking our friends and our neighbors, not to make their lives miserable, but to bring them home and to give them the satisfaction that they're not finding any place else. So Jesus is looking for Zacchaeus, and he sees him, and he calls him, and he invites himself over for lunch. Why does Jesus invite himself over for lunch? I think he does it because he wants to underline the fact that he accepts Zacchaeus. Because when you eat with somebody, except for maybe Thanksgiving, it means you want to be associated with them. (laughs) You only eat with people that you like. And he wants to underline the fact that as hated as Zacchaeus might be by everybody else, that he accepted him. And that he wasn't anonymous to him. Jesus was saying, I know who you are. Even though that I know who you are cuts both ways. I know who you are. You're not hiding from me. I know who you are. I know who you are. To eat together means that you want to be associated with somebody. 
And while everybody else focuses on the bad things that that Zacchaeus has done and the bad person that he seems to be, Jesus doesn't focus as much on what Zacchaeus is, but on what he sees that Zacchaeus can be. He looks at a man and he sees somebody who, while he has it all, is missing something on the inside. And Jesus says, I can help. And so he invites himself to lunch. And something happens at that lunch. The scripture doesn't tell us what. But it goes from Jesus inviting himself over to Zacchaeus' life being changed. What in the world happened at lunch that day? Whatever it was, it was transformational. As we look in this series on bringing them home, we're looking at five different ways that we can engage people. When uh, a couple of weeks before Easter, we collected prayer cards, we asked you to write down the names of three people that you were interested in praying for and working towards and seeing ultimately come to know Jesus. And we collected almost 700 names that day. And it would have been more except that we limited you to three. And so we're giving you some ideas about what you can do to work with God to help bring those people home. And so two weeks ago, we began with the idea of beginning with prayer of praying for those people that are on the list. Uh, Last week, we talked about listening, coming close to chariots, being available to God, engaging with other people. And today, possibly my favorite suggestion for outreach is eating. (laughs) Eating together. Because as what happens with Jesus and Zacchaeus We don't eat only for sustenance. Food means so much more to us. How do you show love for somebody when they're hurting? You bring them food. If somebody has a death in the family, I hear constantly, my freezer is filled with casseroles. I can have no more lasagna in my house. Because that's people's love language. People are hurting, you bring them food. How do you express that you want to get to know somebody? You invite them out for coffee. You invite them out for food. How do you spend time with friends? Well, a lot of times you do it around a meal. If you want to get to know somebody, if you want to spend time with somebody, if you want to help somebody, you invite them out to eat. And that actually is what God does for us. One of my favorite theologians, N.T. Wright, said, when Jesus himself wanted to explain to his disciples what his forthcoming death was all about, he didn't give them a theory. He gave them a meal. And if you think about this, if you go back and look at the Old Testament, the centerpiece of the spirituality of the Old Testament people was dinner. It was celebrating the Passover meal. That was the center of their spirituality. When Old Testament prophets wanted to talk about the future reign of God, they talked about a great feast. When Elijah, with the widow, wants to demonstrate the presence of God, he makes lunch. When the prodigal comes home, they have dinner. When the disciples walk to Emmaus, they see Jesus clearly when they eat together. When the risen Jesus restores Peter, he does it over breakfast. And we are invited one day at the close of time to the marriage supper of the Lamb. So maybe before we invite people to Jesus, or maybe before we invite people to church, we should invite them to dinner. In a nutshell, This passage says about Zacchaeus, salvation came to him because he was a son of Abraham too. He was worth saving. He was loved by God. And then it ends with, the son of man came to seek and save the lost. It's the purpose of Jesus in the world. God is at work doing that. But oftentimes, God uses us. And the 700 names that we wrote down and the thousands of people that are within our sphere of influence, whether personally or by prayer. 
So what are some of the con what are some concrete actions that we can take as we think about uh, the people in our spheres of influence, the people that we wrote down on those prayer cards? Uh, the first is to do what Jesus did and notice people. We're surrounded by folks. And when we started doing 3, 2, 1 a couple of years ago, one of the things I said to you was just notice the people that you come into contact with all the time. Whether it's the person who brings you water at the restaurant you go to, or the checker at the grocery store, or the person in the cubicle next to you, or the kid who sits next to you in school. Notice people. Zacchaeus is noticed, and it invites him into a relationship. Maybe the second step is to change how you look at, at people. I can get really task-oriented sometimes. And sometimes it's really easy to look at people as an interruption instead of as what might be God's purpose for the day. Because sometimes God is in the interruptions. And also, I think in a diverse society like ours, it's really e easy to fall into the trap of only paying attention to people that we know and only paying attention to people that are like us. Jesus steps into the life of Zacchaeus and he looks around everybody else and says, he's important too. Even though you don't like him, even though he's not like you. And sometimes we need to expand our horizons a little bit and change how we look at people. This man is a son of Abraham too. Notice people. Change how you look at them. Get to know people. And that's where food comes in. Jesus gets to know Zacchaeus over a meal because he wants Zacchaeus to know him. People are incredibly open to Jesus. I watched a movie with Allie, my youngest daughter, the other night, and I can't remember the name of it, but it's about this really smart little girl and her uncle, and the uncle is played by, played by Chris Evans, and they're out at the beach one day, and there's this gorgeous sunset in the, in the background, and she begins to ask him great life questions, and she says, do you believe in God? And he says, well, I have an opinion, and she says, what's your opinion? And he says, I don't want to tell you because I want you to make up your own mind. She says, okay. And then she says, do you believe in Jesus? And he goes, love that dude. Do whatever he says. <laughs> <laughs> People are very open to Jesus. Sometimes we're a little afraid to talk about him, but People love that dude. They're just not always familiar with who exactly he is. So I don't think we need to be nearly as sensitive about bringing up Jesus as, um, as we are sometimes. We need to engage with people. People that are different from us are anonymous to us a lot. I read an article yesterday about how Duke University is changing their campus housing policy. It used to be that you could request a roommate, and they're not letting you request roommates anymore. They're just going to randomly assign you to somebody who has, I mean, you ask them a couple of questions, you know, the like sleep schedule and that kind of thing, because they don't want it to, to be a complete disaster. But the reason that they're, they're rand, going back to randomly assigning roommates is that they discovered that everybody was developing their own little homogeneous society. And that they weren't getting to know anybody who wasn't just like them. And so Duke's changing their policy so that they can provide an opportunity for people to meet other people that are not just like them. There's so many issues that are going on in our country right now. We, we talk and we see and we notice race problems uh, are rampant in our country. When was the last time you had lunch with someone from a diff different ethnic background? Maybe you're offended at the whole black lives matter and you insist that all lives matter. Have you ever sat down with a black person and asked them why they feel that way? Or do you just know? Have you ever talked with a cop? Have you ever been on a ride along? Have you ever entered into the complexities of their world? We look at so-called police brutality on TV 
But have you ever asked a cop about their side of the story? Have you, when was the last time you engaged with somebody from a different political party? Not just screaming at them on Facebook, but when was the last time you sat down for a respectful conversation and instead of waiting them to breathe so that you could get your two cents in, actually listened so that you might learn something? People that are different for us, from us are anonymous to us. And the biggest problem with that is not only do we miss the richness of relationships, but we fall into just characterizing, caricaturizing other people instead of treating them like people. This one, too, is a son of Abraham. So invite somebody out for coffee. Share a drink after work. Go to lunch together with somebody. Have people over to your house, not just your friends. That doesn't count. But what about having your friends and inviting another couple? What about meeting your buddies and inviting another person to join the, um, to join the meal with you? Something sacramental might just happen. And what if you took a risk while you were at the table? What if you began to talk about other things that were a little bit more deep than the weather? What if... You began the meal instead and said something like, I'm really glad that we're here together. I'm excited to share a meal with you. Could I say a blessing? And as long as you don't recite your doctoral dissertation, most people are going to be fine with that. Even in a restaurant. I mean, we talked about this in, with praying for people, spontaneous prayer. You know, they share something good and you stop and you go, hey, could I... Could I offer a prayer of celebration for that? They share a hurt. Could I pray for that? Nobody turns that down. We're here. We're having a meal. I feel really honored that you're out with me. Could I say a blessing? Well, sure. Maybe we, get, we need to look around and see our food as sacramental and our table as missional. Have you ever thought of your table as being missional? This is a place where God can be at work. So those are just a couple of things that you can do. But in, in our heart, we're afraid of being awkward or weird. But notice this. Before Jesus engages with Zacchaeus, God is already at work. And sometimes we forget that. Sometimes we forget the work of the Holy Spirit who, if we have been praying and other people have been praying, God is already at work softening their hearts, preparing the soil, and maybe the day before, Zacchaeus wouldn't have had any interest. But in the time of God, the perfect timing of God, when Zacchaeus and Jesus comes together, the Holy Spirit had already been working in Zacchaeus' life, and Zacchaeus was open. Now, maybe... You'll bring something up and the people won't be interested. Most people aren't terribly rude. And if that happens, then shrug your shoulders and move back to the weather and the Seahawks. <laughs> but we shouldn't be afraid of seeming pushy, of bringing up spiritual things. Because if you have a relationship and if you're relatively sensitive and you're working out of a place of love and care, you'll be fine. So God gives us all of these tools and all of these opportunities and he undergirds them with the power of the Holy Spirit. And God is at work in people's lives. And we have to remember that when we engage with them. In fact, one of the reasons why that person might be on your heart is because God put them there. God might even be working in your heart to change the way you look at people. And so we begin with prayer. We listen carefully. We invite people to table fellowship and God works. So I have three questions that I want to ask you as we ponder this passage today. The first is, what would you say Jesus came to do? Second, how does that affect the way you live your life? And the third, who can you share a meal with in the next week or two? Let's pray and prayerfully consider those things. 
loving God, you are the God who seeks and saves the lost. You looked for Zacchaeus before Zacchaeus looked for you. You looked for us before we looked for you. And you're already looking for our friends and our family members and our coworkers. And you are seeking them too. And so, God, I pray for everybody that everyone in this room is thinking of. I pray for the moms and the dads and the grandmas and the grandpas who don't know you. I pray for the sons and the daughters, for the nephews, for the cousins who don't yet know you. I pray for the friends and the couples and the people that we hang out with and do life together. I pray for the co-workers and the fellow students. God, in our hearts, we long for them to know you the way that we do. We long for them to have the hope that we have. Some of the people are ending uh, this life on earth sooner rather than later, and we want them to end their lives with hope. And we want the families that will gather around them to have the hope of resurrection and being reunited. Other people that we're praying for are raising kids, and we want them to raise the kids in a way that will be healthy, that will lead them to you. And so we want them to know you. God, would you hear our prayers on behalf of these people? Would you use us, open up situations where we can love and care and eat and share with them? And would you bring other people into their lives? And God, would you also help us to take the steps that we need to take uh, to love and care for other people? We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.